Okay, good afternoon. I'm Julia Copley, Director of Operations, and on behalf of the MGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our briefing this afternoon, which has been delivered by Renovation Underwriting. Before handing over to our presenters, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping points. Please ensure your microphone and your camera is off, and if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat button at the bottom of the screen. If we do run out of time during the Q&A session, then your questions will be answered by James and Natalia after the event. This presentation is accredited for CPD points if relevant to your ongoing professional development, and the recording will be available on our website and on our MGAA YouTube channel, channel post-event. You will be sent a feedback survey, so please do take the time to complete this as your views on our market briefings are extremely valuable to us. So today's briefing is Works Insurance Fundamentals. It's being delivered by Renovation Underwriting. And I'd like to introduce James Guthrie, Head of Dist Distribution, and Natalia Child, Training Officer. Hello. James, James is a broker, distribution specialist with, with over 35 years experience of the UK general insurance market, the last 20 years of which have been focused on high net worth and mid-market commercial. Latterly Head of High Net Worth Distribution at Gavea, James' career began at Holman's for Lloyd's before moving into specialist Miles Smith and subsequently creating the startup team at Oak Underwriting. With over 20 years experience in the private client marketplace, James is very well known in the high net worth broker community. James is responsible for leading Renovation Underwriting's broker distribution panel, implementing a managed distribution strategy, as well as delivering further business growth from new broker partnerships and collaborations. Natalia has trained hundreds of insurance brokers all over the UK, sharing in-depth knowledge on arranging insurance for property undergoing works. She is an expert in JCT contracts, JCT compliant insurance, liability requirements for works and non-negligent insurance. Natalia has over 10 years experience in insurance with previous experience in high net worth in both underwriting and broking. So James, if I might hand over to you. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, great turnout. Good to good to see you here. And um, slightly different um, type of session for Natalia and I today because we 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 spend a fair amount of our time um, educating down the distribution chain um, into our uh, sort of toba holders and talking to to brokers and their account handlers, uh, account execs, etc. Um, one thing we're very aware of is that there is a um, uh, perhaps a lack of education and knowledge uh, in our specialist area that exists in the marketplace. The CII don't particularly um, focus on works uh, as, an, as, as a module, um, a particular topic within their um, cri um, within their training criteria. Um, and um, it's something that we've worked very hard to um, try and help fill that gap. Today is, uh, as I say, is a little bit different because um, we're talking to our peers uh, in the MGAA world. Um, and I think really this is more about giving you a, a, an understanding of the fundamentals of, of, of contract works, how perhaps, um, you know, we approach that and the solutions that we find and, and why we do that. And, you know, ultimately, um, you'll gather from our background that probably 80, 85 percent of what we do comes from uh, private client brokers. But um, ultimately, we're really, really focused on um, policyholders not losing their their home or property because a renovation project has gone horribly wrong. Um, and that's really one of the, the, the main uh, raison d'etre for um, renovation insurance. I think on, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Natalia, who's far better qualified than I to talk you through the, um, the technical points here today. But we will pick up on questions. And as Julia said, if there are um, uh, particular questions that you want to talk about or, or, or issues you've got in your own business that you want to talk about, post this um, webinar, then please do reach out to Natalia or myself and we'll happily catch up with you on Teams, Zoom, WebEx, whatever. We even do face-to-face -face these days. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, uh, all, all, uh, all things are possible. Natalia, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. And again, thank you for joining us. Um, you can see on the screen there, um, you should see us at Work Insurance Fundamentals, our presentation today, and a copy should be available to you after, after today. So um, some of the information Julia um, 
cupboard about us and our background if you want to find out more about us i'm not really um, that old by the way but you know it just just <laughs> just makes me sound it <laughs> we've seen some of your uh, learning outcomes so if um this is this as julie mentioned this is accredited so these are your learning outcomes this is relevant to your personal development so you should be able to blend the event delegates will be able to describe the benefits of using a jct contract for works and contract compliant insurance. Summarise why it's important for the property owner to stay in control of insurance during works. Outline examples of the cursor of how, of, of how contractors insurance may not indemnify a property owner for works losses. And finally, describe liability consideration for works. This is quite a summarised and condensed session for us. Um, as James alluded to, CPD and training is a huge, huge, huge part of what we do. It's so important because of the lack of resources for works and because often that lack of knowledge is often the barrier and the reason why, unfortunately, people learn the hard way. So the more that we can cascade knowledge and learning and share our experience widely um, with, with as many people and anybody who will listen, um, the better. So. We offer all sorts of training on works on all different on all different areas. So although today will be quite a condensed session, if any of the areas that we talk about today, if you'd like to find out more, if you'd like to learn more, um, then please do um, engage with us and get in touch, and we can um, we can definitely help. Before we get started, I think, uh, Julia, I've got a poll. This is uh, just to get a gauge of the your understanding. Um, of the topic before we get started. So, but this is completely new to me. Basic understanding, good knowledge or expert. It's popped up on my screen too, so I might just put this completely new to me as well. So we've got, um, at the moment, we've got a fairly even split between good knowledge and basic understanding. Um, we've got a couple of people where it's completely new to them, which is really nice to see you join a, a call like this. Um, we don't have any experts on the line, so Natalia and James, clearly that's that's you guys. Um, we'll just give it a moment or two longer. Please, please do answer because this is really yep. helpful for James and Natalia to know who their audience is. And I, I would, I would add that it, it, it's, it's very unusual when we do um, a, a session uh, like this that we ever get many experts because, um, you know, we, we are operating in a particularly specialist niche, and um, for some, some of our distributors, even uh, this type of risk doesn't come along uh, every, every. every day week or sometimes even every month so um it's not uh, surprising that um knowledge is is perhaps not at expert level so we've got our poll responses there so we've got 46 percent have got a basic understanding uh 38 percent of good knowledge and 15 percent completely new to me the remainder not being experts so thank you for that i'll clear that from the screen thank you, thank you. there we go Right, it's just, uh, it's just, had my, I don't think my laptop's had its coffee yet today. So um, number one, number one fundamental works insurance is uh, use a contract. Now, it's, first of all, I'll say though, it's a, it's a myth that works insurance, um, that works insurance and JCT insurance are, are the same thing, or that you only need works insurance if there's a JCT or a contract involved. That's, that's not the case. Um, often I do see um, works insurance just referred to as JCT and, and vice versa. But of our policyholders, yes, it's true, about 80% uh, of our policyholder base does have a contract. And of that 80%, 60% is a JCT contract of the type you can see on the screen now. And another 20% of that 80 is made up of a different contract. Uh, we see other um, more commonly, well, uh, some of REBA contracts, National Federation of Builder contracts pop up from time to time. And there are some sort of lesser known smaller contracts that we see occasionally. But that means that there's a remaining 20% of our policyholder base who don't have any contract with their, uh, with their contractor in place uh, at all, or with um, the various different contractors in place at all. So you don't need to have a contract. Uh, you can actually still have works insurance without a contract and still provide, um, we provide all risk cover for works, existing structure, and we provide the property owner with liability cover. But 
for property owners who are embarking on significant works projects or significant works projects to them involving, you know, um, high risk to their assets and potentially not just, um, you know, um, th- th- their home, if it's a homeowner or either way, property or big financial risk. We would say protect, you know, take the protection of a contract. A building contract such as the JCT contract is set up in order to to protect the property owner. It sets out their relationship with their main contractor. It sets out their rights and their responsibilities and their options throughout the life of the project for a whole number um, of different um, scenarios. It's set up as a a mechanism for problem resolution. So at all different points throughout the life of the project, if there's an issue, the aim of the contract is that the contract provides that method of resolution. So whether it's something um, like the property owner isn't happy with the the work that's been done or there's an issue around payment, they want to know what their rights are with withholding payment or if there's a delay or if they've changed their mind, this should all be set out within the contract. The key section that has the the insurance impact is the insurance section of these contracts. And um, for the JCT, that's section five. And for the intermediate and standard contracts, they both are both under section six for uh, for insurance in both of those contracts. And the key insurance impact of the JCT contracts, ultimately, they all require joint insurance so they all require these these contracts require there to be joint insurance affected for the works and existing structure if there is one and the joint insurance has to be either taken out by the contractor or by the property owner okay so the key sort of insurance um decision i'd say within the jct contract is setting out who is responsible for affecting taking out that policy of joint insurance for the works and that has to be and um, that has to be noted in in the jct contracts a huge one of the, the, the huge sort of fundamental principles of our philosophy for works insurance is making sure that the property owner is in control we speak to unfortunately we speak to people all the time uh, where things happen where things have gone wrong or they've had a loss And being in a position where they have no control of the insurance, the outcome, um, and really not really knowing what to do next is is a a horrible place for any property owner to be in. So it's all about making sure that the property owner is in control so that they have the controls in place in order to, to if if there is something like if a loss occurs, they can get back on their feet as quickly as possible and carry on without it being um, game over. So to put the property owner in control, what we're looking for for JCT minor works, it's 54B. And for standard or intermediate, it's 67B or 67C. These are the clauses that put the property owner in control of insurance. Now, I said this is a very condensed and watered down session for JCT, and we do offer a full in-depth JCT training. So if you want to find out more, then please do get in touch. Fundamental number two, so one is have a contract. There's little point having a contract if the insurance that is meant to dovetail the the contract doesn't. It's um, little point having a JCT that points in one direction in terms of insurance for the project and then having an insurance document that is excluding everything that the contract should be stating otherwise. So have a contract but then make sure that the insurance is compliant with the aims and what's stated within the contract so i said that these joint contracts require the property owner they're referred to as the employer under 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 the contract so if you see employer the employer is essentially the property owner so these contracts require the employer and the principal contractor to be joint insured So there must be a single insurance policy in place covering them both on a joint insured basis. This is where we get into trouble. Uh, It's a dead end under standard home and builders insurance because it's usually forbidden by their reinsurance, but standard non-works home and buildings insurance cannot add a contractor as joint insured 
on a home or buildings insurance policy because that would mean they'd have to then cover contractor caused damage which completely transforms the intention design of that home or buildings policy it's designed for the everyday things that happen in a home or a building and not designed to be a contractor's you know contractor's damage policy so to cover to cover a trade so that's where we usually get stuck so home and buildings insurance is not compliant with jct contracts it also means you know if we provide joint names cover and we're covering the contractor alongside the property owner that means the insurer providing that joint insurance cannot subrogate against the contractor because you can't subrogate against your own insured now all of a sudden the contractor has the same rights under the policy as the building owner and you can see that's why it's such a problem under standard home or buildings insurance the other option, contractor's insurance. So for the contractor to take responsibility for the insurance, uh, joint insurance for works, the existing structure. Um, actually, I will say the contractor cannot directly insure existing structure because they have no insurable interest in it. What you'd be looking at here is potentially a, a third party property damage section of public liability, which is, which is not direct and should never be relied upon as your only source of cover for your property. But... Contract insurance, although it's um, it's partially JCT compliant in that it will allow for uh, joint insurance, you, you can add a, a, a property owner as joint insured on a contractor's policy, either expressly or it could be um, noted or it's part of the policy wording that allows it. It's very risky for your property owner because it may not indemnify the property owner if there is a loss. And the, there are lots and lots of different ways and at different stages at which a contractor's insurance policy may be invalidated. And if it's invalidated or breached, that means there'll be no cover for the property owner. And that's where we get the property owner who is in a position of having no control over the insurance policy. And they're often sort of the silent victim who loses out when um, through no fault or action of their own. Uh, the insurance has been breached or terminated and there's nothing they can do about it. That's because um, almost almost never um, contractors insurance policies, uh, they, don't, they don't have a non-vitiation clause. All of our works policies um, are built around sort of at the heart of them, this, this non-vitiation clause. Non-vitiation is referred to as non-voiding and it's essential to have a non-vitiation clause where you've got multiple insureds, where you've got joint insureds for works, because a non-vitiation clause, non-voiding, it provides independent protection to each party so that one cannot terminate the cover or breach the cover for the other. They've got independent protection under that, um, under that non-vitiation clause. So, yes, contractors' policies are partially JCT compliant, uh, but really they don't offer full sort of protection to a property owner because they don't have a non-vitiation clause, which is what we offer in all of our policies. So what you really need to look for for works insurance here is making sure that it's giving you know, all risk cover, making sure that it's um, contract compliance, but more so you need that non-vitiation clause if you've got to make sure that here that the property owner is ultimately protected and the policy won't be terminated if you have got a uh, if there's joint insurance with the contractor. I've already sort of brought this up a couple of times, but the key thing all comes back to is making sure your property owner is in control. Really, really basic stuff as an absolute basic, but you wouldn't believe how many times it actually happens. Um, for one, the property owner knows that the insurance premium has been paid. How many times we see um, situations where property owners were reliant on somebody else's insurance and they find out when it's too late that actually the um, direct debits haven't been paid or the, the insurance has run out and um, hasn't been renewed or anything else like that and they don't even know that there's no cover at all. Premium paid and the cover is correct. On the whole, um, I'd say it's a, it's a fair sort of um, assertion to make sort of the majority of um, building contractors and they're not insurance professionals, nor do they take an overly zealous interest in their insurance on the whole. So 
trusting somebody else to ensure your property and make sure that the cover is correct and adequate for you is a huge gamble. When you take control of that yourself, you're in a position to make sure that the cover is correct and it's what you need. If there's any mortgage or bank loan that's secured against property, there'll be an adequate insurance uh, provision that you must have adequate insurance. Very, very rarely would flea cover or maintaining home insurance for the work terms or exclusions or relying on a contractor's third party property um, section of public liability would that ever would that ever comply with mortgage to, to make sure that um, with that adequate insurance requirement so to make sure that property owners comply with their mortgage they need to make sure they've got some all risks well to, whatever the whatever the um, adequate insurance requirement is but it's normally all risks cover for um or buildings cover for up to the full rebuild value i said again that non-vitiation that non-vitiation clause protects um the employer and again, you can see that puts the property owner in control because they're not vulnerable there to the cover being sort of breached by somebody else, which is outside of their control. Finally, a couple of other points there around being in control. Um, claims complexity. If this is your own policy, uh, we've got a case study we'll share with you shortly, which um, shows sort of the difficulty here and how difficult it can be managing a claim when it's not your policy. But here... For um, our policyholders, they benefit from a single insurer and reducing claims complexity, so one excess, one loss adjuster, and so on. And claims payments go to where they should. So the contractor is only entitled to you know, stage payments for work that they've done um, and not for payments that are outstanding for work that's not been done yet. And um, the money goes back to where it should in terms of um, the property owner. When the policy is held by the contractor, there's no guarantee that that's going to be the case. Okay, I'm going to share with you now um, that video. So, James, do you want to say anything about this, Sarah? I'll come up the screen. Yeah, share. yeah, I think this is um, a particularly interesting um, video. This is a um, <coughs> gentleman who was. Um, not actually a client of ours. He was um, he was having some renovation works done at his property, and you'll you'll see from the video how that pans out. But he was um, he he he'd done uh, really uh, what he felt was de would decent due diligence in terms of checking the insurance provision of the contractor that was working on his property. Um, and that, that didn't go so well. Um, and although um, in the example the contract works value is not particularly massive or large i think it, it goes a long way to highlight the dangers that policyholders face um it also really highlights you know the gaps um and, th and this is what we're all about in in terms of how we approach the market is eliminating eliminating the gaps and making sure that the um the policyholder has a seamless cover that ensures the works and the existing structure together um we also i should i should say although a lot of what we talk about here is private client we do um we do also tackle um commercial property and commercial developments and 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 actually new builds um in the commercial space etc as well so um same principles apply but i think let's let's have a look at this case study we can see where that goes uh, Nowhere in the contract did it say destroy half the house, but hey, life's full of surprises. The house had an existing dormer, which is a room in the roof, and we wanted to extend it and to get building regulations. So we got planning permission and then we commissioned a builder to do the work. The project cost was unbelievably 38,000 pounds. The day the house collapsed was the 6th of August, 2020. My wife and I were on holiday in a holiday home in North Wales. 9.30 in the morning on that day, the phone rang, a number we didn't recognize. Leasman had said, are you Mr. Hobby? I said, yes. He said, your house has collapsed. Two men are trapped in the rubble, but they're screaming. So we take that as good news. And I'm like, good news? How can that be good news? And then the line went dead. When the dormer was being done, the builder decided to take the whole roof off and replace the roof. But he didn't put in props for the party wall, that's the wall adjoining us and our neighbours, the gable, which is the front 
triangle and the chimney. By not propping it with wooden props or steel props, he turned those structures into what the engineer called freestanding structures and they were obviously liable to collapse. It was the chimney pot and, and the chimney stack collapsing through into the first floor that caused all the damage and that led to pretty catastrophic losses on our part and, and a catastrophic accident that left people injured, left the house destroyed. When we engaged the builder, one of the first things we did was talk about insurance and he showed us his direct line tradesman's insurance certificate. It was direct line business to business. A day after the accident, we actually called direct line who confirmed that there was a policy in place and confirmed the amounts of liability cover that were there. And so I just assumed, well, he's covered. Uh, and two days after the accident, Direct Line actually sent along their loss adjuster. Anyway, after that, Direct Line effectively went into radio silence for six months. They did what insurers call they, uh, reserving their position. So they reserved their position for six months and were refused to make any comment. They said they were investigating. And uh, throughout this whole process, here we are nearly nine months later, with Direct Line still refusing to pay. There's a financial difficulty, there's an emotional difficulty, and there's a practical difficulty. We've had to go and live somewhere else in a small flat by a railway line for eight and a half months. No, the whole thing has been an absolute nightmare. Immediately when you talk to James, you understand how he's feeling and how frustrating the whole process must have seemed. We spent a long time talking to each other on the telephone, looking at his documentation to try and find angles that we could work through that would help him recoup some of the losses caused by the collapse of the building. We do an amount of pro bono work every year of this type where we feel insurers are not looking after their policyholders properly. And this was another one of those situations really. The biggest problem with any homeowner, particularly when they're doing to what to them is a large renovation project, is that most of them have no acquired knowledge. And so doing a renovation project is a little bit like walking into a pitch black room with holes all over the floor. And they're trying their best not to fall down them, but actually you don't know what you don't know. The perfect position for James would have been to engage an insurance broker who specialised in placing renovation risks to make sure that the contractual arrangements between <coughs> him and the contractor were such that he'd stayed in control of the insurance for both the house and the works during the project and then if uh, this incident had happened and he was operating under those terms the damage to the existing structure would have been covered the damage to the works that had already taken place would have been covered and in terms of liability, he'd have had absolute security knowing that if the contractor's cover failed and the contractors ended up directing personal injury claims against him, he would have been insured. For most people, their home is their single largest asset. When what you value most is at highest risk is the point at which you need to concentrate most on having the right insurance cover in place. In that example, and I mentioned earlier that I want to really stress that contractors insurance can fail for lots and lots of different reasons and at lots of different stages throughout um, throughout a claim uh, claim process. So, in this instance, first thing that happens is the um, direct line receive the um receive the claim the first step here is just validation checking through and making sure you know ticking all the boxes is the application correct um and looking through perhaps the original proposed original application form and if all of that ticks the boxes the next step might be looking through and seeing if there are any endorsements terms conditions clauses on the policy have those been complied with investigating taking that step and again at any stage here if anything doesn't if anything is um in breach or it's not it can't be sort of evidence that it's been complied with. Again, you could have another situation here of contractors' insurance failing. All of that sort of goes through, everything's fine. We're looking at public liability, then it's the you know examination of, of negligence, exploring liability there and to see 
here it's not a it's, public liability is a huge if it the triggers negligence and that rests on a, a complex legal test and again it's not it's not it's not a guarantee there's no guarantee that um contractors insurance will indemnify property owner and we hear all the time oh but i really trust my contractor they're a good friend of mine they're a family member irrelevant because it's not them that will decide if the, if the claim is paid it will go through their insurer and that strict process so if anything don't put that pressure on any such sort of um friendship or you know um or relation with a contractor and just leave it it's, it's it's insurance so make sure the insurance is correct nothing else nothing else comes into it so and on that 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 example that failed that that one failed due to non-disclosure of financials so that little paragraph in at the end of every application have you ever had any ccjs bankruptcy ivas and so on um they discovered some undisclosed ccjs and they uh, took the position that the policy never existed, cancelled it ab initio and refunded the full premium. Um, no, no cover at all. Yeah, very nice, isn't it? There we go. Figured it out. So it takes me on to number four, which is self-explanatory. Contractors, insurance isn't king. But lots of different, lots, like I said, lots of different, lots of different factors and things to consider here. Contractors, um, you know, the, the, the cover varies a lot. You, it follows that the less you pay for insurance, the, the less likely it is going to, the less likely it will pay. So it may be sort of more, um, more prone to sort of heavy terms, conditions and exclusions. So see, the more you pay for insurance, the, the wider the cover may be. But still, there's a universal truth of public liability that you need to prove the negligence. So there's always an if there. Terms, conditions. Uh, making a claim, as you saw in the video, is uh, on the liability policy. Um, well, and this actually, in that example, we didn't get as far as uh, the liability question because it failed even before it got before it got any further. But had it all gone to the next sort of next stage in terms of the claim process, proving negligence is really complex and it's not straightforward and it may be down to a lack of evidence or expert witnesses you may know what has happened but can you prove it and that's uh, that's entirely different and as you know contractors often have a little idea of their policy coverage uh, and really understand exactly how it operates or how it doesn't operate so don't rely on contractors insurance five Property owners need liability cover. There are really three main pillars to what we protect under works policy. We're protecting the works. One, existing structure, if there is one. So as James mentioned, we also cover new build, so it might not be an existing structure. And we also cover projects which involve a full demolition. Uh, and therefore, if they're not keeping any existing structure as part of that demolition, technically demolition and new build. But if we are keeping existing structure, then existing structure is the second pillar to this. And the third is liability. All property owners need liability cover, but it's not a one size fits all. Um, different, really, it depends on property owners' role in the project and the type of project. So you can be, and again, we offer, this is um, an in-depth area. Um, if you'd like more training or more sort of um, more in terms of um, liability, then please get in touch with, me, touch with us and we can point you in the right direction for that or set something up for you. Um, so liability for projects which involve a main contractor. It's a minimum of property owners liability and that will cover losses not connected to the works or if they're sued in a joint action with a contractor. This is where it's really pertinent to sort of have that distinction between main contractor or self-managed clients. Self-managed clients have wider liability exposure. Um, self-managed clients may need full public liability uh, and they may also need employer's liability as well. And then there's also um, a special type of liability that also applies to works, uh, in part thanks to the Party Wall Act, which is non-negligent liability. The Party Wall Act is a protective piece of legislation passed in 96, which protects the neighbours of people doing works. So if the Act applies to your works, your client's property, then they have a strict liability duty to their neighbours to pay for or make good any damage caused by the works. Because it would be unconscionable 
for neighbours who have not asked for instigated works or works of you know, have no benefit to them. It would be unconscionable if the neighbours, neighbors of people who live next door to people doing structural alterations and works to their property, if they could only um, have a valid claim for any damage to their property, if they could prove negligence, and often losses occur in the absence of fault or where it can't be proven because it's very complex proving negligence. The Party Wall Act removes that ordinary negligence requirement and, and elevates it to strict liability. So here, if the Party Wall Act applies, um, affected adjoining or, um, adjoining or neighbouring owners do not have to prove negligence. They just have to prove that the loss has occurred due to the works. So what that means uh, with that strict liability of falling on the property owner who instigates the works, that means that there's an extra duty on those property owners who are covered by the Party Wall Act. So a prudent property owner whose works and property are covered by under the Party Wall Act, a prudent property owner in that position will always take out non-negligent liability unless... Um, they're quite happy to pay for any possible neighbouring property damage that occurs often through um, no fault of their own and down to contractors' actions, but where there's, you can't prove their negligence. So non-negligent liability is also a consideration for, a strong consideration for property owners where the Party Wall Act applies. We've got our next poll question now. What percentage of works projects overrun? We should have a poll popping up in a minute. So is it over 55%, over 75% or over 85%? And I'll just be, um, let's just say here that we don't, works policies, our policies don't renew. So although our policies don't renew, our world of renewals are extensions. So we are extending any projects that are not finished within the, the policy duration. Our aim is to marry up and make sure that the, the policy duration we're offering matches the project duration, whether that is short term, a few months, or whether it's multiple year. But if the work isn't finished on time, then we'll be extending. So what have we got? What's everybody, what do we think? So seven people say over 85%. Three over 75% and two over 55%. So, so seven of these people have had work done on their house then. <laughs> it's looking like an informed poll, this one. Yeah. You're actually, you're all correct. Because the answer is over 85 uh, Sorry. Yeah, you're, you're all correct. So over 85%. So even if you said over 55%, you're still right. Even if you said over 75%, you're still right. And if you said over 85%, then you get all the gold stars. Do, have we got have we got the sim, have we got the similar question on um, over budget, or is 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 that in no. the poll? No, just yeah. anecdot anecdotally, I think that's the other one, isn't it? That um, I think the figure for that is something like 79% go over budget. So 85% over schedule, 79 over budget, something like that. Um, oh no! Sorry, I've got it the wrong way around. Ninety-two percent. I I should know that. We've got the right numbers. Got the right yeah. numbers. But the wrong way around. Ninety-two percent. Yeah, over. Uh, so it's the other way around. I was thinking it was slightly under. Um, but yeah, I think I think for those of us that have had works done at our own properties, that's unsurprising. But it's it's actually quite shocking, really, and and it's been exacerbated um, probably since the pandemic with the um, shortage of. Um, uh labor and you know difficulty and cost in, of, of supply of materials has been um exacerbating that situation yeah so i know it's in, in in a perfect world we would have all the time in the world to um to to uh, we'd, we'd, we'd we our, our you know clients would give us plenty of notice that they're doing work so they wouldn't just tell us sort of a last last minute the, the work's about to take place you know friday afternoon to a monday we'd have plenty of time uh, we know that's not always the case 
but permitting if you allowing extra time and money for a project is always it's always a good idea um as sort of a general rule let's say about 25 about if we look at the amount of by, the amount by which we extend policies it's usually about 25 percent so um on the whole people tend to us, underestimate their works project by about 25 percent in duration and obviously for every day that they're running over they're obviously spending more money so it follows the two sort of go hand in hand uh, we know as well that the state of economy is having a huge impact on works and pressure for longer projects, especially um, in view of indexation and rising costs. So, again, we do have some extra information on this in terms of to help alleviate that for, for longer projects as well to take into account um, inflation and indexation as well for longer projects. So, again, um, if, that's, if that's something you'd like to find out more about, then please get in touch. But those are our six fundamentals um, for works insurance. I hope you enjoyed. We'll take any questions now, I think, maybe, James. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. And I know that I've, um, I've said to you previously that in my old role as an underwriter, um, contract or works, um, contract or risks always used to come up as a bit of a hot potato on the high net worth port portfolios that we used to look after that, you know, there was a good number of people that just didn't really, me, me among them, didn't really understand the concept, the concept and the requirements, etc. So, um, so really, really interesting uh, presentation. So thank you for that. So I have a question and if delegates have any more questions, please do drop them in the chat box. We'd be really delighted to hear from you. So the first one is, um, is it true that if a property owner has works insurance, then the contractor would not need any insurance? So we, as I said, I can see why people think that because a lot of the focus as well is all around making sure the property owner, property owner is in control and the property owner stays in control of insurance. That doesn't mean that the contractor doesn't need any insurance at all, though. If there is a JCT contract or a similar type of contract, the contract will state what insurance the contractor needs to have. So commonly in a JCT contract, it will say that the contractor needs to be is responsible for insurance for the work. So that often is a, looks like public liability for works, property damage, personal injury, death, and so on. And even without a contract in place, um, you'd still expect a contractor to have liability cover for their liability to others. Thank I think you. I think we've 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 um, <clears throat> focused here a lot on um, obviously um, single contract works and and you know the type type of covers that we provide in terms of uh, a seamless approach to risk. That's not to say there isn't a time or place for um, annual CAR. Um, and and you know the contractor should be properly protected anyway. I think it's, with us, what we're really looking at in our approach to works is eliminating those gaps that exist for the property owner. Um, yeah. and, and and you know, yes, the contractor will always say I'm fully insured, and they are in terms of what they do. Yeah. Um, but if they burn the rest of your property down, you might have a problem. Um, so you know, there, there's there, there's there, there, there's elements to consider there. But um, yeah, that's a good answer, Tony. Um, so another question, um, what about, which is often the way uh, works have already started, what happens in that circumstance? So like I did say, if, in a perfect world, our, you know, we know that clients would give us plenty of notice that they're about to do works and it would all, you know, <laughs> we'd be able to do everything in, in that, it, with, with lots of time and um plenty of notice however we know that that's simply not always the case if it's not you know 10 to 10 to 5 on a friday that we're notified of works sometimes it's even later sometimes it's at renewal when it's actually uh talking through their renewal and just off the cuff well i'm about you know nine months into into a works project i'm thinking that's not going to not going to change anything at all if anything sometimes a client expectation of that might be just an extra 50 pound on the premium maybe don't realize that actually they're opening a bit of a can of worms here and it will take a bit more time to you know, make sure that the insurance is correct if works have already started it's not the end of the world um, as long as there are no situations which see no loss situations that have already arisen we can provide um, full cover 
um, subjects of see us we'd, we'd underwrite as if we'd been on the cover from the start so there is a premium implication there so that may be a consideration depending on how far along the project is um is, is underway thank you Ms. Collier. Um, and then on the same topic what information needs to be provided to you to consider a risk where works have already commenced i think it would follow so we have um our full sort of um, risk data capture for our um, October holders, we have that on an online platform. So it would be sort of, again, just it would be the it, it, the same sort of, uh, uh, the early stage would be the same as we'd ask for, for any risk to find out about the nature of the project, the works, the location, the contractor, uh, risk management and so on. Obviously, there's a bit more that's involved with the project that's already underway to yeah. understand exactly what's, um, what's <laughs> taken place so far. We do, we do from time to time get asked to pick up risk where, um, other, uh, yeah, other insurers have have, have literally have, have refused to extend or or such like. And you know, an, an example of one of those uh, quite recently, um, we had actually seen the risk um, pre inception of the works, and um, we'd um, I think we we quoted at the time, but it went it went to uh, another provider. Um, they. Uh, decided not to offer an extension at, at, after a, a couple of years on this particular project, uh, which is when we looked at it again. But when we looked at it, you know, the risk management um, uh, procedures at on site um, were were just not adequate, and actually it was it was largely being self managed, which again is something that we have question marks over, particularly if it's if you know if it's a property developer that's self-managing their own project and they, they get pulled off in, in different directions. So with that one we actually took a, a, a decision not to offer terms uh, at that point um, because of the way the risk presented, if you like, mid works and um, because of the lack of uh, proper control and procedures in place. Um, but but we have a team of bespoke underwriters and I think much like the audience here today, you know, um, a, a, a lot of uh, a lot a lot of us will have uh experts expert underwriters in our teams and and it, it's it it's it's about that um that acquired knowledge over a number of years of underwriting and we, you know we, we are very interested in who the contractor is for example particularly if it's a basement deal we'll, we'll be interested in um their 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 history their trading history you know um all, all the elements that create the risk it's not it's not a one size fits all it's very much um bespoke approach to risk um, where you need that level of expertise and understanding in your team to properly to properly um, cater for that. But we, we do actually, and this is, this is a little bit contentious in some areas, but we, we do actually believe that there should be pretty much a price for most risks in the field that we, we underwrite in. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it, it only becomes perhaps more of an issue where as I say, the risk management elements aren't, aren't quite where we'd, we'd expect them to be or the experience of the contractor or other factors of that ilk, really. Thank you for that. Um, so, again, you mentioned there about the, con the contractor again, James. Um, have you got or could you give advice that, that, that our MGAs could give to their brokers regarding how to select a contractor? I mean, if, if we've got six six uh, rules of works that we've just covered. <laughs> well i mean there, there's 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 some there's some obvious basic ones i mean check company's house check directorships you know check check the trading history i mean if 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 you know if the company is is you know if it's a house of straw and they keep sort of popping up and blowing down then probably not the best contractor to use so um having said that there's some quite big um failures in that world um Caridium went um, relatively recently um so not to say that um you can always see what's coming down the pipe but yeah it's been um it's been a bit of a turbulent time yeah. uh, over the last couple of years but you know all of the obvious ones um I, natalia anything else you you would yeah. say there okay, you know, due diligence around contractors is massively important because works insurance it what to say any insurance works insurance is there to protect against sudden unforeseen and identifiable loss and so it cannot, the works insurance policy will not cover the quality of the contractor's work. So if you have a cowboy builder that, you know, botches everything they touch and, you know, at opposite to the Midas effect as, as it's such, because they're inept, because they're unqualified, that can, that's, um, that's something we sort of delve into sort of defective workmanship and deliberate damage because the act, their actions could only result in loss. 
Um, and so then that's not um, that's not unforeseen loss. So do the best protection against the quality of the contractor's work is the due diligence, making sure you've got the contractor with the right experience, with references, um, and that you can, you can, you can verify, you verify those. Thank you for that. Um, and then I've got another question. Um, again, if you have questions, our delegates, please drop them in the chat. Can renovation underwriting cover existing structures only? Oh, see, no. If we were to cover, this is something we get asked all the time. Because um, often property owners in, uh, in about to undertake works, they're under the impression that the contractor has insurance. So that's not a perceived problem for them. They think the contractor's got insurance. That's fine. They don't understand all different ways that contractor's insurance could fail. And so their only perceived insurance need is often their property because they're aware that their property is going to you know, uh, or they've been told that it's not going to be covered um, under the normal property insurance. So often they'll ask, say, I just need property insurance. The contractor's got insurance. I just need property insurance. Our philosophy is all about putting the property owner in control. And that means being in control of the insurance for the works and the existing structure. If we offered existing structure only cover, that would mean putting them in that position where they're reliant on somebody else's insurance to cover the works. And if that fails, then we're into we're into into problem. Our philosophy is all about making sure we are the, the single insurer on for the loss. Uh, if there's the JCT, we're the primary insurer, and we're providing that insurance that on the three pillars for our property owners, our policyholders, works insurance, existing structure, and liability. So we'll always cover works insurance and the work. Um, I have another question. Thank you for that. Um, if you have a long-term project. Um, for example, 36 months, how do you deal with a rise in material costs? Ah, that's, yeah, that's, that, that, that's an interesting one. So generally speaking, I mean, there, there, there's, there's sort of day one uplifts built into our, our, our wording anyway, uh, both for uh, works and existing structure, um, I believe, but where we're, so actually in, in terms of, if, if it was a 36 month contract, it should all be rated in at the outset. Uh, if we get extensions on anything that's run for longer than the 12 month period, we are looking at the inflationary factors that affect that. Yeah. Um, but my understanding is, is that when we're rating for a 36 month contract, we're rating for the, the full period. And then the wording facilitates some flexibility in terms of the, yeah. um, the uplift. Should we do a little plug here, James, about what we're coming up, what we've got coming up in January, actually? Because that might be really relevant to anybody that wants to find out more about this. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. far away. <laughs> so we, um, we know, and it's something, as I, as I, I speak to breakers, breakers day in, day out, um, and insurance professionals and, um, and underwriters, that this is the hot topic at the moment, inflation, indexation, and how to protect clients against underinsurance. Um, we are hosting a market briefing that's going to be in January, which is really just going to focus on uh, uh, these sort of um, hot issues at the moment. So one of them will be around, again, around inflation and protection against underinsurance. Um, please do feel free to send me the details of that and we'll be happy to promote that to wider membership. That would be great, Julia. Right. Um, so on that note, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I just wanted to to say, and again, from previous experience, being an underwriter in a in a, a firm that offered high net worth household policies or portfolio but household policies, there was always that fear that if you lost your policyholder to another business that were providing works cover, you might not get that policyholder back. Um, so the reason I'm saying this is because I wonder if this is an opportunity for um, you and given that you've been kind enough to give up your time to speak to our members today to just kind of reassure members that if they were to come to you to look for works covers, you wouldn't be looking to take their, you know, their household yeah. cover because that's no, not absolutely. we don't we, we don't cover yeah. normal. We don't we only cover property unless it's going through works or it's uh, it's unoccupied, normally unoccupied pending works. Uh, we don't provide any other insurance yeah. unless it's unless, unless it's involving structural alteration. Normal everyday property. I, I would go. I would go even further than that. I know. I know. I know the angle you're coming from uh, there, Julia. And, and you know, we um, so renovation underwriting was um, a wholesale broking operation. It grew out of a retail broking 
operation douglas brown rmd had um uh, a rural um you know and estate type broken business for a number of years and he still has a few of those clients actually on a very old legacy book that one lady looks after uh, in our st Neots office um the, the the rest of our business now uh, we switched to mga in 2018 to reflect the fact that at that point 90 95 percent of, of the business we were getting was was wholesale via brokers anyway um it's it, it, it's more than that now we all we, we, we also run a uh, um a treaty arrangement for alliance with hiscox which covers their works as well that's that's our facility but um as i say probably 85 percent of the business we get comes through from brokers and the, the bulk of the rest from hiscox um yeah. <clears throat> we don't write direct and actually um if we if we if we get orphan clients approach us we have a find a broker tool on our on our website that points um points clients towards our um top supporting brokers but in terms of any uh anybody working with us or alongside us we would we would never um we, well we don't write any other as, as natalia says we don't write um standalone property anyway you know we write works um the the uh, attaching existing structures we do a little bit of unoccupied which is leading to and um, post works and then we can place a specialist liability terrorism other elements in the open market if we need to um one thing that's coming down the pipe for next year and beyond actually is is what's this space for standalone non-neg liability we may well be um launching a facility on that basis in the new year we write non-neg at the moment but we write it where we're again where we're writing the works but we're looking to expand our offer um and that's quite a complex specialist uh, topic as well so we might be coming back to you to talk about that in more detail um, but if anyone if anyone on the call today or any of your members want to have um you know uh, a confidential discussion about um where we can help i'm more than happy to do that um yeah, get in touch with myself and natalia and we can we can we can always have a, a chat about um and even if it's just for advice to be honest if it's just for advice in terms of what you guys are doing um the issues you face in terms of works etc we have uh, uh um you know a, a real high level of expertise in our business not necessarily myself um natalia obviously more than me and then we've got um doug and all of our um, technical team uh who who are experts in this field we're, we're more than happy to help where we can lovely um if anybody needs uh contact numbers for renovation underwriting then feel free to contact the mgaa um so that just leaves me to say thank you ever so much again for your time james and natalia really interesting topic um very specialized and you know the fact that we know that you wouldn't poach our members clients is uh, always reassuring but yeah always do send across those details for the um the market briefing in january and we'll share those with our members um, i do uh and still still got the one final because you see on the screen now your learning outcomes that we shared at the start if yep. you do still have time i know we're going a little bit over um we'd love for you to just fill in the the last one see if that's helped uh, if we've got any sort of differences in terms of the responses there for the rate your understanding piece let's have a look so we've got how do you rate your understanding of the learning content works insurance um expert good knowledge basic understanding oh a, a great great uh more, think, yeah. good knowledge there. looking like a good improvement in good knowledge again it's, it's it's going to be hard to create experts in 45 minutes but that's yeah. not bad it is our condensed sort of session today we don't have uh, nobody don't have... advising that it still feels completely new to me which i think is a great yeah, achievement that's good yeah i'm really happy with that great thank you very yeah. much thanks all for joining us and i uh, hope everyone has a good afternoon thank you thanks very much, very much. Thank, thank you, you. <laughs> cheers thanks julia